hit record and it's recording okay. on my side uh maybe yeah. you have to okay. okay okay oh well are we think we're working excellent okay. i think we are okay awesome sorry about that that's okay what i was thinking of doing is i've got um, a presentation with lots of pictures and i know that you said there's folks that have lots of different uh, cryptocurrency mining experience and, and you also wanted to hear a little bit about zen so um I, I have information on both and so i was going to go through the mining presentation kind of quickly and then leave time for questions um at the end on pretty much any topic except for things that i feel that are personal information and i'll just say that um so i'm going to go ahead and get started is that cool yeah absolutely all right let me see if i can figure this thing out here Okay, looks like I got a uh, got a share going. Excellent. Okay, cool. So yeah, uh, Bitcoin mining in North Georgia. That's uh, the state of Georgia, not the country of Georgia. But uh, this is a, a picture that I took just a few days ago of our mid-sized cryptocurrency facility. And I'll take you through a tour of it and talk about uh, some of the things that I've learned over time and some of the things that I, I recommend. Okay, so uh, first off, yeah, why do cryptocurrency mining at all? Um, that's that's a, a great question, and I get that a lot from folks. And um, here's the uh, facility during the daytime on the inside. You can see I, I built a little box inside the box here. I've actually got a business partner, so I don't do everything myself, me and my business partner, and then we get our kids in here to do some work too. But uh, nice. we're fortunate that we don't have any investors, we don't have any customers, we don't have any employees, so we kind of come and go as we please. <laughs> it's always the best. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, it can be very profitable. Um, when I first started this a, a couple of years ago, I, I bought a, a Antminer S7 on Amazon, and I called the guy up, and I'm like, hey, can you actually make money on this stuff? And he's like, well, now you can, but people that have been mining for the – uh, previous two years hadn't really been making much money. If they'd been mining and holding on to the Bitcoin, they'd uh, be making money now. And that was, I think, when Bitcoin was about three hundred dollars per Bitcoin. So now it's uh, you know very quick return on investment. I consider anything good that you get payback for all your stuff in better than ten months. Uh, some stuff it's faster than that right now. Uh, it gives you a way to buy crypto at a discount um, and. Some people are like to acquire it anonymously, and uh, you, you can feel like you're part of the overall cryptocurrency ecosystem. And compared to lots of different hobbies, this one's fairly harmless. Um, so we're, we're, we're good with that. Okay, so I got started. Here's a picture of the Antminer S7 that I got going on here uh, with a couple of HP power supplies. And I had to move those out of my basement. And so I rented a small facility first. And you can see uh, that I started putting a couple amp miners there. And I put some 30 amp circuits on the wall, which wasn't the best place for them. But I kind of jump into the middle of everything and uh, uh, thrash around and figure out things to do and things not to do. Um, there's a lot of roll-up garage door industrial type places, so I figured out I put a vent in one half and a fan in the other, and that's the way I got my uh, cooling through. And my advice to everybody is just start. Figure out what you can buy right now uh, to get you stuff next week, and just by starting, you'll learn a whole bunch of different things. So if I was going to recommend someone to start right now, in fact, I was just talking to my brother a few weeks ago um, in Toronto, he, I'm like, look, you can build a GPU miner. GPUs are expensive now, but if you, for example, get an NVIDIA 1050 Ti, that's not too expensive. You can build yourself a GPU miner, and uh, it, it should be pretty profitable. Where there's still people selling AntMiner D3s on Amazon or eBay uh, for pretty much the same price that I paid for them back in July or August. And those are pretty profitable too. So just get started is my advice. Uh, here's some pictures of when I got started. So I started out with um, with amp miners, uh, S7s, and I started stacking them up. And then in the upper right corner is my first GPU miner. I did everything not optimally, as you could probably see, but I did it. And in the bottom right, that's the kind of GPU miners I, I build now. Everybody's got different types and styles that they do. Uh, this one works the best for me. So my background experience, I got a little bit of technical experience. I was an officer of the Navy on a submarine out in Hawaii for a while. Uh, so I'm an electrical engineer, nuclear engineer. 
and uh, an IT guy, and I uh, get my son in there to help me. Uh, our three daughters, they spend a lot of time doing gymnastics, and so we're fortunate to be able to homeschool them. And he uh, likes technical stuff, so it took him a little while to learn how to do troubleshooting, but technical troubleshooting is a pretty valuable skill, and it comes in handy, especially with GPU miners. Um, and so now I can just ask him to go fix things, and he'll just go fix them, which is great. And uh, uh, I think it was about a year ago, uh, um, I, I finally paid him like a Bitcoin for uh, all the work he'd been doing. And it wasn't worth that much then, but it is now. <laughs> so uh, that worked out. Did you right. overpay? You know, I don't think I did. Uh, and you know, maybe if he hodls for a while, he'll be able to get his own car when he turns 16 later on this year. So. All right, so there's a bunch of different things that you need as a miner. Um, I got a whole list here on the left, and you don't have to start out knowing all these things, but eventually you'll end up uh, learning and uh, getting them all figured out. Uh, but really the ability to research and learn is a big one. Uh, and like I said earlier, developing a troubleshooting methodology. And when I talk about um, different mining operations, uh, I usually talk about you know, home miners where people, less than 20 miners, and they're using, uh, they're, they're mining as a way to take their dollars that they earn at their day job and convert it into cryptocurrency in a fun way. Um, or medium, which is kind of what I consider myself, where um, do this as sort of a full-time business. I guess it's a full-time business. Um, and don't really do anything else, but there's not the complexities of employees or investors or customers or other things like that involved. So what my uh, website and videos and this presentation is mostly tailored toward is people that want to make the step into home mining and then go up to medium sized mining. All right, so here's just a picture of common mining hardware. Uh, this is an Antminer uh, S7, I think. Uh, it's from a while ago, and there's there's a lot of different miners, but what because we're talking about miners a lot, and I just wanted to show you there's a bunch of different ones there, and they all typically use around a thousand to fifteen hundred watts. And it's going to become important uh, pretty soon. The um, and, and there's different type of algorithms, and so you get a miner, you figure out, and then you look and figure out what kind what algorithm it's got and what what you can mine. And any of these types of miners that I got list, listed on the left are profitable these days. So you can, get, you can get started on any of them. All right, so first off, space. Uh, I leased this space that's in the picture, and I have a very wonderful and uh, excellent landlord. He let me make a lot of modifications to the building. I put down a deposit to be able to, um, uh, you know, if we ever leave, to put everything back in place. But you can see I rolled up the big garage door. I cut four holes in the back. I put a lot of uh, electrical gear in. And I have a number of friends that are looking to do something similar. And none of the people they talk to are willing to let them do that to their building. So they're all going and buying buildings. Um, and you definitely want an industrial area because these fans are noisy. And I was talking to the, my landlord about the noisy fans um, before we did it because we all negotiated this in the lease contract. Um, and he's like, well, you know what? Maybe it'll provide white noise because the people that live behind our facility here, they get really mad at my diesel trucks that start up at 5 a.m. and go make deliveries. So he's like, maybe it'll make a nice background noise. I'm like, yeah, sure. Uh, so, but uh, look here on this drawing. So there's a little green transformer at the left. So one of the things that I did was make sure that this building was right next to the industrial power lines. And I checked with the power company that they'd be able to either upgrade a transformer or drop a transformer there for me. Because in every situation, no matter what building you buy or lease, you're going to need more power. You're going to need to bring power in. Oh, so I got a little, I got little notes through here about... Um, things that you might want to do to make things easier on you later as you add more miners. And one of them is to number your miners and number them systematically. So when I mean rack, I mean like a stack of shells. I get them from Home Depot and uh, you know, just number them. So like I have miners that are 1208, 0523, things like that. And uh, that lets you go find them when you need to troubleshoot them later on. And we use professionals. Uh, I use a general contractor, use an electrician. I'm an electrical engineer, but I, I'm not an electrician. I don't know code. I'm, I'm not used to doing all this stuff. So we hire people. 
And, uh, you know, we got uh, permits from the county and uh, fire inspection and all sorts of things like that. Uh, that helps when you want to get insurance and uh, do other types of things like set up bank accounts and stuff like that. Okay, power. That's a big one that you're going to need. So here was uh, the initial power build out. And uh, what I've got here is right in front of my son, Grant, there is a big 1200 amp uh, circuit breaker. So when big power is brought in, and I got a 500 kVA transformer, um, it comes in three phase. So uh, the, that three phase is then broken down into three 400 amp panels. And uh, you can see three cables go into each of those 400 amp panels. And then single phase is pulled off those. So I have a whole bunch of 30 amp, 208 volt single phase uh, connectors uh, going out to some uh, 30 amp common receptacles like you'd plug your dryer into. And then I have a power distribution unit, which is just a big extension cord and, and power strip. And then I can plug in, depending on the miners, three to six miners per PDU. It allows for a pretty flexible arrangement. Now, people ask me if, uh, you know, uh, backup power. No, backup power is too expensive. You don't want to do UPS. You don't want to do diesel backup. I mean, if the power goes down, which I hardly ever does, then you stop mining. You're not paying for power, you're not earning mining, whatever. That's cool. When it comes back up, you want everything to come back up. And that's why fan controllers that are mechanical are so important. Um, so that's a lesson learned. Uh, uh, electronic fan controllers don't come back on when the power comes back on, but the mechanical ones do. And whenever an electrician talks about electricity, they only mean 80% of what they're actually talking about. So if we're talking about a 30 amp connector, that means 24 amp steady state you don't want to wear out all the wires and things like that. So here's some more pictures of the build out. Uh, I mean, these are big, thick electrical cables, copper electrical cables. And you can see in the bottom left here, uh, well, those are the PDUs that are plugged into the standard 30 amp circuits. I looked at the pricing on going bigger than 30 amps and things just started to get more expensive. Like a, you can get a 30 amp PDU for about $170 and most electricians can work on this standard stuff. And um, yeah, I've got, my cabling isn't the nicest, but whenever I have free time to go in to the mining facility, I spend time getting broken miners working or optimizing miners and cabling is always an afterthought. Maybe now that we're fully built out, I'll have time to do stuff. And I got a picture of a solar panel here. I did play around with solar panels. That seems to be one of the questions people ask, hey, uh, can you do solar power for mining? And then I go through and explain how much power uh, miners actually use. And, you know, this is a 100-watt solar panel. So, yeah, sure, I could get 30 of these, and maybe that would power during the day. But, you know, maybe during, closer to the equator and supplemental power or power air conditioning. However, in the bottom right, me and uh, my son and some friends, we went to a local hydropower plant and got a tour there. Now, that's some real power. That's, uh, that's the kind of power we like. All right, so cooling. I tell people, put in more than you think. Well, y'all are in Winnipeg, so maybe it's not that hot in the summer. But, <laughs> yeah, we size it for the things that we need here in Georgia, which gets to 95 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. And each of these fans in the picture are 20,000 cubic feet per minute. And, uh, boy, I guess I want to convert to cubic meters per minute. Uh, what do I do? Divide by 40? Um, anyway, so my rule of thumb is for the heat of summer, uh, about 200 cubic feet per minute per miner. And we haven't had to supplement with evaporative cooling. You can see that concrete floor, that actually acts as a really good heat sink or cool sink. As the sun goes down and it cools off at night, um, that floor gets cold. And as the air blows across the cool floor, it actually drops the temperature uh, of, the, uh, of the air that's coming in. And um, in the winter, there's definitely low humidity. And so in some places, I know that the people have to add, uh, you know, they have to add humidity to the air to prevent um, static electricity. Okay, yeah, here's some more pictures of the fans. Uh, so one of the things I learned at my first site was definitely get filtered intake fans. If you don't get filtered intake fans, uh, your miners are going to be picking up all sorts of dust and you're going to have to open them up individually and blow them out or clean them out or whatever you want to do. So if you can catch that stuff out front uh, before it even gets into your facility, that's a big plus. And then uh, the bottom left, yeah, that's, uh, we kind of created an air tunnel. So I'd say that's maybe a thousand square foot, um, square foot, 
Anyway, uh, 1,000 times 10, maybe 10,000 square foot, uh, cubic foot little room that we created, uh, kind of a plenum, and we jam a bunch of air in there. And then we have the miners just take a suction on the cold air that's jammed into there, and they blow it out into the outer room. Uh, that's the plan that worked for us on this. You can see in the bottom middle picture, it's a deep, long um, industrial space. Most spaces aren't deep and long like that. They're shorter and wider. So in that case, you'd use multiple hot and cold aisles, but you'd still want to direct the air where you provide a cold aisle section and a hot aisle section and you exhaust out the hot aisle. Here's some pictures of the fan controllers. Over on the right, um, there's two uh, variable frequency devices and two electronic fan controllers. I thought I'd use the variable frequency things to make the fans go up and down in speed to kind of get a, a neutral static pressure on the building. Uh, but I don't bother with that. So the next four fans, we just put mechanical fan controllers in. That seems to work. Um, data networking and security. Uh, this is pretty straightforward stuff. It takes a little bit of time to learn um, IP addresses and how to set up translations and things like that. I'm really big on the Cisco Meraki access point because you can access it from anywhere. So I could access my Meraki uh, access points when I'm traveling. I just go to the log into the Meraki web dashboard and I can do anything that I need to on the firewall uh, there. And um, it really is worthwhile to statically reserve IP addresses for your miners from the very get-go. Because I got up to like 150 and then I couldn't figure out what IP address they were and finally I took six eight hours straight and just re-IP addressed everything. It was tedious, but it was definitely worthwhile. And then uh, I recommend 48 port LAN switches. I used to use Cisco ones, but I might switch to these um, ingenious ones that uh, someone pointed out to me. Um, and then if you've uh, done the rack number and position of the rack for the miners, you can actually make your IP addresses match the rack and position number of the miners. So for example, miner number 1214, I just pop open a browser if I need to and go to 10.1.12.14 and there it is. Um, when you start to get above, uh, you know, you, you can name your miners, I guess. I just give them numbers. Um, all right, so mining software. The, ASIC miners will come with their built-in software. You can see the um, AMP miner software there at the bottom. If you're gonna build a GPU miner, there's a lot of different choices for what you can do. A lot of people on their first GPU miner will start with Windows. Uh, it's easy to use. And then you can get, um, you can download common uh, Windows versions of the uh, applications. The problem is you start to scale up and get to you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 miners is if you wanna remotely access them because uh, I'm not at my mining facilities very often. If you want to remotely access them with Windows, you got to get a VPN and then remote desktop or do TeamViewer. You got to get a GUI, basically. And so uh, after doing that, I switched over to Linux, where I'm pretty comfortable with that, fortunately. You can do things on a command line. Um, and so one of the more popular posts on my website is, um, from a year ago at least, hopefully it's still accurate, is how to build your own um, Linux mining rig that, does just everything on the command line with no GUI. Uh, you have to do some uh, funky things with Xorg to be able to do that. Um, but I switched over to doing a purpose-built mining software. I use Ethos Distro. I know other people are happy with uh, PIMP. And I think I named those here, oh, maybe not. Um, and I, I like those because they update them regularly, they got all the things, and I can actually put the configuration for all my different GPU miners in a single text file and just update that uh, remotely. Um, people ask if they should do solo mining or run their own mining pools. You know, I've done that. It's a lot of work. Um, unless you have the time and capability and a few hundred miners, I'd recommend don't solo mine or use your own pool. Um, there's all sorts of different opinions about this, but um, I recommend just get your mining stuff up and go and connect to a pool, figure out a wallet, and uh, definitely don't mine to an exchange. Uh, they're not happy about that. Um, and it's not really the best practice. To me, best practice is mine to a software wallet on your computer, and then every week or two, uh, take whatever you've got in mind and send it to a hardware wallet. Uh, some hardware wallets actually have issues with lots of small transactions, um, like the Ledger wallet has a problem with many small transactions, so some people had mined to their Ledger wallets and then were unable to get their uh, mining proceeds off because they had too many small transactions. Um, anyway, 
And then, oh, backups, encryption, passwords, two-factor authentication, do the things that you need to do for security for sure. Uh, monitoring and management. So I used to uh, write my own, well, use my own open source um, management software, an open source uh, program called Zabbix that I would configure. Um, but I really like Awesome Miner. Someone told me that there's an open source version of it, but let me tell you why I like Awesome Miner. It's not that expensive. I think it ends up costing like $5 per miner uh, for a perpetual license. And um, for, the, uh, for the Bitmain miners, if the hash boards get X's on them, like they, they, they stop hashing, it can detect that and reboot it. Um, if it's zero hash rate, it can reboot it. First, I was having it notify me and reboot it. Then I'm like, I don't want to be notified. I just want it rebooted. So I, I, I would do that. And then it also goes in, uh, to different pools and it, it uh, tracks different uh, currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies. So right now, I've noticed that there's a lot of uh, low price cryptocurrencies are going up in value a lot. So I've um, switched a lot of my mining on X11 over to Mu and on my SHA-256 and script miners over to Digibyte, because uh, those are low price cryptocurrencies. And so I'm just gonna mine those and hold on to them for quite a while. Um, but I always, always mine some of the main cryptocurrencies as well. And I'll talk about, a little bit about some of that strategy in a minute. Um, oh yeah, here we go. So uh, some people, they go to what to mine or coin wars and say, what's the most profitable thing? And I'm gonna mine that right now. Well, the, the reason in a lot of cases why things are most prof profitable is because they have, they've had a short-term price rise. So if you're always mining the most profitable thing, at least to me, it means that you're not getting as much as you could be getting when the price was maybe lower and the corresponding hash power was lower and you're a larger percentage of the overall hash power. So it is most prof you can do that if you turn around and sell it right away. But I don't turn around and sell stuff right away. I want to mine cryptocurrency and hold on to it for a long time, um, at least a year, so I get long-term capital gains. But it'd be great to hold on to it to maybe some utopian future where um, cryptocurrency is no longer taxed and I can just start using it to spend on stuff. But anyway, uh, I say it's most profitable on, on the look back. So if you look on the previous page, I don't know if you saw, but each one of my Antminer D3s was earning in Awesome Miner's estimation, about $10 per day of mu. That's cool. That means, you know, if my electricity price is about $50 per month, I'm netting about $250 per month on, on mu. But what if mu over the next year or two doubles or even goes up 10 times? Then on the look back, instead of earning $10 per day uh, with those, I would have been earning, I don't know, $100 per day. $3,000 per miner. So to me, it's best to find some cryptocurrency projects that sh that have features that they're going to be around for a while. And they have a, an idea of what they want to be and they have a plan and they have marketing and they have developers. You know, just like you'd evaluate a company uh, that you want to do business with and mine that stuff. Um, there's other, definitely other ways to do things as well. But this one's the, you know, you don't have to be constantly switching. You don't have to be constantly staying on top of stuff. You set your stuff to mine and then a week or two or five or six weeks later, you're like, okay, is that still what I should be mining? Maybe I should be mining something else. And then you switch it then. Um, and so anyway, that's the way I kind of go about things. Now, certainly you can... I've gotten to the point where I need to sell cryptocurrencies to pay for electricity. Um, I, I got pretty good electric rates here, not really as good as um, you know places that have all hydropower, um, but I average about six cents a kilowatt hour American, which isn't bad, but that's still about $20,000 a month in uh, electricity that, that I pay. So uh, I take stuff that I've mined more than a year ago and uh, convert it into Bitcoin or Ethereum. So uh, when I go to my accountant, I consider that long-term capital gains. Um, and then I'll, I use uh, GDAX, so part of Coinbase. I'll send it over there and I'll have it sit there. And these cryptocurrencies, you all probably noticed, they're pretty volatile. So when it goes up in price to what I consider a, a short-term high, I'll sell some then. Uh, ideally, I like to keep on hand enough um, uh, dollars to be able to pay for expenses for the next six months. Um, 
anyway, uh, there's a lot of other ways than mining to earn crypto. It took me a while to learn this. I'm not sure why it took me a while to learn this, but there are cryptocurrencies there that you can stake. So basically you buy them and you download them to your local wallet and you keep your local wallet connected uh, all the time and you earn cryptocurrencies. Some of the more popular ones for that are Stratus and NEO. Um, in fact, NEO, you might not even have to keep your wallet connected. You just kind of earn it. Uh, and then there's masternodes. Dash is uh, the big thing with masternodes and uh, played around with some of those last year with, with Dash. And you, you have to get a thousand Dash and then you have to have a, a node so, uh, that's connected to it and you uh, stake your, or tie your Dash to your node and then you get, I don't know, I think it's like seven or 10 or 20% annual return on it. So if you're gonna hold on to your Dash or whatever copy of Dash coin, like Mu or Influx or uh, coming up soon is Helium, there's a lot of uh, folks that are doing cryptocurrencies based upon on the Dash model uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, not, because Dash, not all the mining proceeds go to the miners, only 45% do. The other 45% go to the masternode holders and 10% go to the uh, foundation so that they can hire developers and marketers and stuff like that. It's kind of a more sustainable uh, cryptocurrency if you're not out there in the lead like Bitcoin is. Uh, there's ones where you can vote and earn, uh, like with Decred um, or with Steemit. If any of you all have gotten on Steemit, uh, I recently learned. Uh, I, I, again, it's something I wish I'd learned earlier, but I'm able to take some of my Steemit holdings and uh, get this organization called Minnow Booster to vote it every day. And if you vote 10 times a day, with Steemit, you earn more Steemit dollars. In fact, you earn a lot of them. So basically, I delegate my uh, Steemit to this Minnow Booster, and they go around and upvote new users on Steemit, and I get a bunch of Steam for doing that without doing anything. It's, it's really great. Um, and then, uh, like ARC, you can delegate uh, to other people to vote for you, and you can earn more ARC with that. I think LISC is the same thing. <coughs> And uh, then there's position and day trading. Uh, I'm not really good at day trading. In fact, I'm really bad at it. Uh, I say I'll do position trading where if I hear about some you know, new cryptocurrency and I, it meets my evaluation standards, uh, then and it's cheap and it's new, I'll buy a little bit and then I'll just hold on to it. Uh, and then maybe once it goes up five or 10 or 20 times, I'll sell a little bit of it and get my original money back and then just hold on to it. So that, that seems to work. Even if you don't want to do any of that, you can earn cryptocurrency by selling or servicing mining hardware, writing software, improving it, um, finding a new cryptocurrency project, like the one that I'm involved with, Zencash, and do marketing or do uh, promos or events or things like that, operate mining pools if you're really good at stuff. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of different ways to uh, earn money. The thing is, this is a fast-growing new market. And in a fast-growing new market, you just want to be there. You don't even have to be very good. That's what I learned in the IT industry when we were doing, uh, uh, back in 2002, we were doing those Cisco phones. They were brand new back then. Uh, and I'm like, oh yeah, this, we're gonna replace every phone system out there. Uh, you know, all the Nortel systems, they're, they're gonna get replaced by Cisco. And that's what we did. Um, and so I'm like, okay, cryptocurrency, that's another new fast growing market. I gotta be there. So anyway, um, I do have a video tour of my a larger Bitcoin mining facility, uh, and I also have a, a short presentation that gives you an overview on Zen Cash. Um, but what I'd like to do is um, open up for questions. Awesome. Kevin, that yeah, Kevin, tell great. me what, what you want me to do uh, here for y'all. Well, I think questions is a great idea. And uh, if you're okay, I'll put up the lights a little bit. And, uh, yeah, sure. I'll stop doing my screen share here too, so I can uh, scare you like a big Darth Vader head. Okay, there we go. Can you see any of the peoples? You have to look this way, peoples. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, hey, man, that's a good crowd. Yeah, we got a, we got a good crowd here. <laughs> so, questions? Yeah. yeah, close to the Mac. The Mac is the only way. Uh, yeah, thanks for taking the time. Uh, where do you see mining in the next year or two in terms of going with the 7 uh, NM process in the near future from AMD and NVIDIA? Do you see uh, do you see mining still being a thing considering Ethereum is going staking in the future? What's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And that's part of the thing that, that I, I got to do to evaluate my own business if I'm going to stay 
uh, in business. And sometimes with, with ideas like this, I like to say, okay, what's going to happen in 20 years? Are we still going to be mining cryptocurrencies in 20 years? I'm guessing eh, maybe not. I don't know. There might be a few. 10 years from now, I, I don't know. I think two, three, five years from now. So I've kind of got a backup plan for what am I going to do with the facilities that I've built out. Um, you know, I was talking with Kevin earlier about aquaponics, and uh, my hope is that um, – you know, marijuana is legalized in Georgia and I'll just turn them into big grow houses. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> to address your question directly, uh, so semiconductor process technology is really important to mining. Uh, people ask me, okay, do you uh, just, do your miners wear out and do you replace them every six months or 12 months? I'm like, no, I run the hell out of them until I have to replace them because of semiconductor process technology. So we saw that change over when we went to 28 nanometer technology down to four, uh, 16 nanometer technology with the ant miners because basically it went from – you take whatever the feature size is, the 28 nanometers or the 16 nanometers, and square it. And that feature size squaring it gives you a, a rough measurement of the relative power usage. But the upshot of it was when we went from the S7s, which used 1,500 watts, and did 3.5 terahashes to the S9s, which used the same amount of power and did three, four times as much terahash. Okay, when's the next changeover going to happen? When are we going to go to the next process technology? And if you follow the Intel fab uh, track, they're like, well, 10 nanometer and then 7 nanometer. And it takes a lot of money to build out a 10 or a 7 nanometer. You got to basically replace all the equi equipment. It's a billion dollar proposition. And if you're going to do 7 nanometer technology process, I think most people are going to do 10 first. But 7 nanometer is going to be four times as efficient as 14 or 16. So uh, think about, okay, Antminer S9s, the equivalent in a 7 nanometer process is going to be doing uh, 70 terahashes for the same amount of power. Uh, 10, ter 10 will be around 50 or 55. And I've heard rumors that they're going to be coming out with them in, in February or March uh, with like an S11. So I don't know. Um, but having said that, with the price of Bitcoin compared to the overall hash power out there, I think even Antminer S9s is, are going to be profitable for a couple of years for people uh, that have already paid them off, people that have uh, electricity that's less than seven cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, I think there's going to continue to be forks of uh, Dash and Bitcoin and Litecoin that are going to continue to be uh, valid for mining for a while. Um, and as far as the 7 and 10 nanometer process, I don't think that the miners are going to get first shot at that. I think the cell phone manufacturers are because that's where the real value in low electricity is going to happen. Then the processor guys like Intel, then the memory guys, and then the uh, general purpose ASIC market. Anyway. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Questions? Anybody got some questions? If someone's just starting mining, what would the initial uh, – best to start off like rather than like when you start with one miner or is it better to start with three like with the equipment that you need to get uh what would be the best way to start start going well you know it depends on how much money you have but um to, to, to be to be flat out um and I always tell people to start with one. Maybe mining is not for you. Maybe maybe you don't enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy it because I'm, I'm a techie kind of guy, but not everybody necessarily enjoys it. So if there's – but I, I do encourage you to say, okay, if you're going to start mining right now, go to uh, Amazon or eBay and buy a, an Antminer D3 or get a GPU miner. So get all the basic parts. You can go to my block operations website. Um, and see, you know, it's got all the instructions for building out a six GPU miner. You don't need to buy six GPUs to start. You can buy all the stuff and then uh, buy one or two or three GPUs. There's a guy, uh, Boss Coin, he does, he calls, uh, does what he calls a triple. So he just buys three graphics cards and you can really lower your cost that way. And if you did that, I would suggest getting at this point in time, an NVIDIA 1050 Ti, a GPU. Start with one or two or three of those. And GPU mining, you can get all the equipment for that like within a week and be up and running. Um, same thing with an Antminer D3. Those are still pretty profitable. You can probably get one of those used uh, for $1,500, $1,600 and a power supply for a couple hundred bucks. And you saw what the thing on Mew was. So you can get that paid off in four or five months and then continue mining for a while. So that's my suggestion. Antminer D3 or GPU miner using NVIDIA 1050 Ti's. Thank you. Awesome. Anybody else have any other questions? Jake has any 
Yes. Jake has a question. Should, should I get closer or? I can hear you. Oh, perfect, yeah. wonderful. Um, I was gonna ask, so you said you use uh, ETHOS for a lot of your mining, correct? For my GPU miners, that's correct. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Okay, so for your, for your GPU mining, so how do you find that in comparison to Windows? For ETHOS, can you mine other cryptocurrencies as well? And if so, um, do you find that the performance is the, the same or better than on a regular Windows machine, Windows 7 or Windows 10? Yeah, so the problem I had with Windows 7 or 10, besides not being able to mine not being able to manage a bunch of miners with it is I didn't feel like paying the hundred bucks for windows 10. So I get the free version and it reboots every week or two. Uh, and then I come back and be like, Hey, it's not mining. Uh, right. And, um, so that, that was kind of uncool. And with, uh, now you can do a lot of tuning and you can download Claymore and opt or not opt but a whole bunch of different applications, uh, and run on windows. And it's a great, easy, safe way to start. In fact, if you have a gaming machine, uh, like my son's got a gaming machine. Um, you know, he, he downloaded the nice hash uh, miner and whenever he's not gaming, he runs the nice hash miner. And so he slowly builds up a little bit of uh, Bitcoin on nice hash by uh, doing that. And I think that's a great thing to do. Um, but as you uh, do bigger miners, I find with ethos, it lets you customize pretty much everything that you want. Now with AMD graphics cards, like the RX 480 and 580, you got to, um, you have to update the BIOS on the card to uh, undervolt it and really get the max performance out of it. And that's kind of tricky and I've kind of killed some cards doing that and I'm not really good at undervolting it. So that's why I like NVIDIA because you can tune the heck out of NVIDIA cards uh, just with the ethos distro. So on those, I'll crank the clock speed by 500 and I'll limit the power to about 160 watts. That's at least on the NVIDIA 1070s. Um, and then I'll run whatever uh, applications come with the ethos um, uh, application. So it's right now it's got EWBF, which uh, lets you do Equihash mining with NVIDIA cards. It's got uh, DSTM. There's a new one called B Miner, which I heard is really good, uh, but it's got Claymore and ETH Miner. And then it's got uh, CC Miner that lets you mine just about every single algorithm out there. So there's a lot of flexibility with Ethos Distro, uh, and it gives you a panel that updates things, and um, they maintain all the security. Uh, by keeping it a very uh, slim operating system. So I'm really happy with it. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Uh, could I just ask, the 1050 Ti, is there any particular reason why you, you chose that to recommend to us? Well, yeah, because I was looking at the prices versus the hash performance. And I liked the NVIDIA 1070 back when I bought them for like $450 each. But you go to some place and get them now, they're like $900 or $1,000. And that, that's a lot. Whereas if you look at the 1060 or the 1050, or to me, it seems like the sweet spot for price versus hash rate right now uh, is the 1050 Ti. So you can probably get those for uh, less than, I think, less than $200 each. Uh, and they have maybe a third the hash rate of the 1070. So you're not going to get as much, but you're going to be able to pay the rig off quicker um, and run it for a while. And then at some point in the future, you can upgrade your hash cards. But it's a great way to get started. Awesome. Have you had any problem with taxes at all? Uh, I pay my taxes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the only problem that I have is I hate bookkeeping. Uh, so I set up my mining uh, as a business, as a limited liability corporation here in the U.S. Uh, your profits and losses flow through to your personal tax return by doing it that way. Uh, so I'm able to take uh, all the money that I spend on equipment and build out and lease. And uh, I'm traveling to Latin America for consulting. Uh, with on Bitcoin mining here in the next few weeks, all that travel is going to be going onto my expenses uh, and that offsets the income. Uh, so the way that I need to do taxes uh, is just like if you're uh, mining uh, copper or something like that, uh, you mine a certain amount during a month and you got to claim that as income. And then whatever you mine, you hold on to it for however long you hold on to it and then you sell it and you need to claim that as capital gains or capital losses. And that's how I work with my accountant and that's how things flow through to my tax return. When, I mean, at the, 
amount of crypto and expenses and different things. That's the only sensible way uh, for, for me to do it. If I was had maybe five miners at home um, and I just used the income I use in my day job to get cryptocurrency and I just mine it and hold it, um, I'm not sure that's, you know, as a similar situation to what I'm talking about is operating a mid-sized mining business here. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody? Oh, Camille, you got a question? Yeah. Hi there. Um, to add to your 1050 TI, I don't know if you've considered uh, doing 1030 GTs on Equihash. They're not bad and they're available for under hundred bucks. Oh, I haven't even checked those out. Yeah, you can get small form factor ones. Uh, also, another tip I'll give everyone here. Uh, right now, like Vega cards are really good. If you can go on Amazon, you can probably find a built system for under $1,000 that comes with one. Huh. Uh, if you look oh, hard wow. enough in our craft, I mean, you could. No, they're available. I've seen them. You just told everybody. Yeah, well, they won't be available anyway. But yeah, well, I mean, but you got to share this information. It's uh, yeah. you know, all, all us small and mid-sized miners should work together and share information. We're not really competing against each other. We're competing against the really large industrial scale miners. Is the way I feel about it. So yeah, those are great tips. My other concern is uh, because Bitmain, you know, decides to sell uh, whenever they feel like their hardware to manipulate markets. We know it's it's happened before. Uh, do you think this round of GPU mining is going to be controlled by the Chinese and are they going to move to Canada because of uh, their bans? Yeah, I know. Isn't that exciting? I'm, I'm happy that miners are getting banned in, in, in China. Um, and there's all sorts of places around the world that they can move to. It's funny, I, I, I was talking to folks all over Latin America and everybody's finding places where there's extra power and they're getting it for two or three or four cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of work involved in my, moving uh, cryptocurrency miners from one country to another and there's a lot of friction there and, and I would expect that a lot of those miners um, might not be as efficient as the newer ones that are out there but since they're sunk costs and they don't have to really do anything except keep them running they're going to keep them running but if they have to make the choice of palletizing shipping them and things like that you're not, I bet you're not going to see more than a third or 25 percent of the hash rate in China come to other countries um, you know if they do ban it completely. So who knows what going, goes on over there? Tell you what, I don't. Uh, this is a question regarding Zen cash. Yeah. Uh, is that okay? um, so what kind of differentiates you guys from the other uh, kind of privacy uh, focused coins using ZK snarks? Yeah, so like, uh, I'll tell you what, I've got a little like seven slide presentation I'll share here just to get everybody up to speed on it. Uh, to answer your question directly, uh, it's like, you know, everybody can come up with good ideas. It's the execution of the idea over a long period of time that makes a significant difference. So uh, let's see, this is when I did, I stripped it down uh, a little bit. Uh, I gave this at the Texas Bitcoin conference, uh, but this is just the highlights. Um, so let's see, share screen and uh, this is not what I was doing. Uh, what do y'all see in there? Are you seeing video tour Bitcoin mining facility or designing and building a resilient cryptocurrency? Designing and building. Woohoo! All right, um, I know what I'm doing. All right, start from the first slide. Okay. Um, great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I helped found Zencash. This was back in May. So me and a few other guys were mining Z Classic, and we got together, and we're like, "Wow, it'd be great if we could get Z Classic onto like a Ledger wallet." And everybody who's part of the Z Classic group was like, uh, "No, because uh, we're only a copy of Z Cash, and if we start messing around with it, then we can't do that." So Z Classic was a fork of Z Cash that removed the 20% founders reward. And we looked at that, me and a, a few other guys got together and said, wow, it'd be great to do exactly what Z Classic did, but make it kind of like Dash, uh, and then add in some info security type things. So you're right, it's a privacy coin. So imagine, actually, it's kind of hard because we've been conditioned through the people farming overlords to uh, realize that we don't have privacy. But imagine if you actually had privacy in your life, um, and 
uh, you could go about uh, not being concerned that everybody's uh, trying to figure out what you're doing and, and, and doing nefarious things. And I mean, maybe you just are a private person. Anyway, uh, so we think there's a, a need for people to be able to have the ability to do things in a more private fashion. And so Zencash was designed for privacy. So it's a copy. We take the best of kind of a uh, Bitcoin. So the blockchain and the proven technology um, of how Bitcoin works and uh, copy Zcash basically. And I'll explain what the features that Zcash added. It's the zero knowledge proofs. Um, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And then some ideas from Dash of redirecting some of the mining reward funds for treasury and governance and, and also paying nodes to operate. Now, Dash pays 45% uh, of the mining rewards uh, to the masternode operators. And to have a masternode, you have to have 1,000 Dash. And Dash is, I think, about $900. Um, last year, uh, Dash was maybe seven dollars, so seven thousand, or yeah, seven thousand dollars for a master node wasn't that big a deal. But now nine hundred thousand for a master node is is a big deal. So there's a group of people that essentially uh, set all the governance for for Dash. And we're like, eh, you know, that's so we like to have a bunch of nodes out there because nodes are important for resiliency of a cryptocurrency. So we said, okay, what is the answer? Well, the answer is forty two. 40 Hue Zen, and then you can run a secure node and you get paid part of the 3.5% payout if you meet all the criteria. So that's kind of what we did. And then we said, okay, we're going to do some information security. We're actually going to encrypt the traffic between the nodes and the nodes in the wallet. Because most cryptocurrencies don't actually encrypt that traffic. And there's other things we're going to do too. Um, so not only is it a cryptocurrency, but you can send messages on the blockchain, fully encrypted privately or anonymously. And I actually had to learn what the difference between privacy and anonymity was. So public, you know, like the Bitcoin blockchain, it's public. It's pseudo-anonymous because nobody's name is out on the Bitcoin blockchain, but um, anybody can track your transactions and kind of trace them down. If I wanted to have private transactions where you and I know that we're transacting with each other, but nobody else does, that's private. We can also have anonymous transactions where we can do transactions with each other and neither of us knows who we are. So that's the difference. Privacy is the people know who they are and nobody else knows what they're doing. Anonymous is nobody knows who they're transacting with. Um, and so one of the things that we're looking to do to differentiate it is to actually make it very usable. So Zcash is a great cryptocurrency. They're not putting a lot of effort yet into uh, wallets, mobile wallets, uh, desktop wallets, integration, uh, with different things because it's such a neat and new cryptocurrency and has some uh, features they've been added to a lot of exchanges and people are doing work on their own to uh, make Zcash more usable but we said okay with Zencash we're going to take that treasury funding and we're going to pay developers and we actually don't have just a core set of developers we have many different development teams that are operating in parallel as we're bringing you know project management and uh, small business uh, efficiency to a cryptocurrency project. All right, so let's talk about one of the key differentiators, which is the shielded transactions. So Zcash, they came up with a really cool idea where they said, okay, we're gonna have a regular Bitcoin blockchain, and then on the same blockchain, we're gonna do a whole nother set of transactions um, that instead of using the lingo of unshielded transaction outputs uh, and, and respending, not unshielded, unspent transaction outputs and respending unspent transaction outputs, you're going to have something called commitments and nullifiers. And these are notes, and these notes are a little bit bigger than a typical uh, transaction that gets wrapped up into a Bitcoin uh, block. Uh, but these commitments and notes have a very unique feature. So um, we have two Your different types of... Changing. Sorry, Rolf, but your slide's not changing. Oh, okay. Uh, is, it, is it saying Zencash shielded transactions? No, no, just the original splash screen. Oh, wow. Man. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, uh, we let like me. The logo, just not that much. Yeah, no, no kidding. Let me stop sharing and restart yeah. the sharing, and I'll go through them uh, in, in kind of a uh, not so fast. Let's see. Share that, and then I'm going to run this. 
Oh, I see what I did. Slideshow settings in a window. How about that? Okay. And slideshow, start from the first slide and go. How's that? That's better. All right. Imagine a world where you had some privacy. <laughs> All right. Um, so Zencash, Bitcoin, Zcash, Dash, kind of coming together. We got a wallet that works on Android. We got one that's coming. It's going to work on iOS soon. It takes a little bit longer on iOS. We're available on, on exchanges, uh, integrated with coinpayments.net. We're all about usability. Shielded transactions. All right, this is where you kind of need to see the slide, see what's going on. So there's two types of addresses. There's a uh, transparent address, which is like a regular Bitcoin address, and a shielded address, um, which nobody ever knows the shielded address. And you can do these um, shielded addresses, you can do shielded transactions, and you can go back and forth. So I can go to Bittrex and buy some Zen Cash and transfer it to my full up uh, GUI wallet on my PC or Mac or Linux. And uh, it's a transparent transaction. Then I can send it to myself into a shielded transaction and I can keep it there as a shielded transaction. And then I could send it to somebody else in a shielded transaction. And it's recorded on the blockchain, but all anybody sees on the block explorer is that a transaction happened. When it went from transparent to shielded, all anybody saw was the transparent um, address and the amount of funds. But shielded to shielded, nobody sees the addresses or the funds. And one of the unique things about shielded transactions is as long as they're a, uh, an encrypted note, uh, there's the ability to place a 512 character message in there, kind of like a tweet, but bigger. So uh, anytime that you send a shielded transaction, you can put a note in there. And we're like, oh, wow, this is really cool. So we can do encrypted transactions, completely private or anonymous, and we can send messages. What if I was like Julian Assange and I posted a Zencash shielded address on my website and said, hey, send me some money uh, or send me a, a link to uh, you know a anonymous document and he, he you would have no idea who sent it. Nobody could track who actually sent it. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of other uses for that as well. Probably more between different businesses that don't want to, you know, get each other's uh, confidential business information. But that's the big difference is the uh, anonymity is built into the blockchain. It's built into the protocol and you can go back and forth between uh, unshielded uh, transparent transactions and shielded transactions. You can use it for messaging. And then if you include the URL of a uh, anonymous uh, publishing uh, application, uh, IPFS will be anonymous at some point. Um, made safe, uh, may be anonymous. SIA, Bitmain just came out with a new SIA miner or a Blake B2 miner. SIA, I believe, is uh, anonymous type publishing. So you can include that URL in the message. And what it looks like is uh, um, over on the right, so our swing wallet has overview, it's got addresses, um, and it has messages. And you can, you can send and receive messages from people using the Zencash blockchain. Now you can actually do that using the Zcash blockchain also, but nobody, as far as I know, has built out a wallet to let you do that easily. And then this can be integrated into other people who might want to have messages. So then you ask the question, well, what if somebody doesn't like what we're doing? There's a lot of different ways that you can attack a cryptocurrency project. One of them is do a denial of service. There's lots of other ways, but that's why we're paying people to run full Zencash nodes. We've got over 6,000 Zencash nodes out there that people are running because we're paying them to run. So you should be able, and we're doing full internationalization. And then from the treasury funds, we're paying people uh, to be ambassadors and go out and teach folks in meetups how to use send cash, how to send it, receive it, send messages, receive messages, and do things like that. Because in America, probably Canada too, you know, we don't live in a place where you really need to have privacy. Um, but there's some places in the world where if 
uh, the government or your competitors or the local mafia or whoever finds out what it is that you do and they'll kill you. So those are kind of more of our markets for Zen Cash. Um, and then we have a, a Zen Chat application. Um, oh yeah, I just talked about all the all the secure nodes. So yeah, we've got nodes that are running up out there, and if you're able to buy or acquire or mine uh, 42 Zen Cash, then you can stand up your own node, um, and you can be part of the overall wow. network worldwide. And we take a lot of the funds, and we recently announced, and I didn't have it here, a partnership where we're um, contracting with IOHK. IOHK is a big um, cryptocurrency um, organization. They recently contracted with the folks, um, some folks in Japan, and, and launched Cardano, which is, I think, one of the top five cryptocurrencies now. That same group, uh, we're working with them to do two things, uh, come up with a treasury model, and one of the cool things about our treasury model compared to Dash uh, is that with shielded transactions, we're able to set up a treasury model where people can put in proposals and then do an actual secret ballot during the voting period. And when the voting period is over, nobody knows during the voting period what the results of the voting actually is because it's using shielded transactions built into the protocol to do the voting. At the end of it, um, the, the vote is announced and uh, you get to find out what it is um, that the community or how the proposal was done. So that's pretty cool from a treasury uh, and governance standpoint. And we're gonna work to make this community uh, driven and community managed as much as possible. Um, and then we're, uh, the second research project is to basically, now that we've built a whole big, wonderful cryptocurrency, drop a new engine into it. So we're doing some research into uh, like a DAG protocol, kind of like what, um, uh, uh, IOTA is using or, or things like that because if we can get from every two and a half minutes a block to being able to do a DAG where it's updating quick and being able to scale and all sorts of things like that that'd be great so we've got the funds to do it and so we're gonna do it um, and then this applies to everything if you're gonna be mining a cryptocurrency and this is kind of how I started because I'm like man if I'm gonna put so much time and effort and the output of my miners into mining a cryptocurrency I'm gonna hold on to it for a while I'm gonna evaluate it you know, what's the market that they're going after what's the team like what's their track record of success what's what are they actually able to accomplish what's their roadmap who's who are they partnering with um, and, you know like Monero's the original privacy coin or one of the first ones out there and Monero's pretty cool. They're doing a good job. They got a good uh, market cap. They've got a lot of acceptance in a lot of different areas. But I never mind Monero because I just didn't like the attitude of the people when I went and um, you know joined their community thing. So I'm like, yeah, you know, there's a lot of cryptocurrencies out there. I'm I'm just gonna hang out with the ones that I'm comfortable hanging out with. Um, Anyway, hopefully that answers your question. It's, I know that I provide long answers to questions, <laughs> but uh, hopefully that helps. Awesome. No, we really appreciate it. Great job. Thank you very much. Any yeah. final questions from anyone? We have, we have one more question. <laughs> Bogdan's going to come up here. Okay. Hi, are you open to joining, let's say, other projects like uh, supporting the you know technical side of, let's say, a new cryptocurrency like um, Sencash, but doing something else? Me, me personally? Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not really open to doing much. Um, <laughs> makes me feel <laughs> kind of lazy. I, I don't know. Uh, I got four kids. Uh, we homeschool them, and I got you know the cryptocurrency businesses that we going on. I'm in, involved in Zen Cash, and I thank God we're growing because we're ha handing off all these responsibilities to people that are really energized to to do them. Um, from an advisor role, uh, I'm happy to talk to folks. Um, mm -hmm. Just like I'm, I'm going to travel through Latin America, and I'm going to talk with three or four different uh, groups of people that are doing cryptocurrency mining. I, I'm not even sure I'm actually doing consulting. I'm just, you know, glad to go to different countries and talk to people about something that uh, I might be able to offer some assistance or some insight on. So I guess the answer to your question is maybe, but probably not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, okay, let's see. You know, if you if you find out what the project is about, might be you know different. Uh, yeah, if you want to provide some follow-up information, maybe we can talk said, further. You said that advisor, yeah, yes, as, a, as an advisor yeah. of the project. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. 
but I'm not really all that technical either. I'm kind of a jack of all trades. And so I would consider myself kind of more of a technical manager or things like that. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Rob. Lots of excellent information. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time for us, Rob. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for reaching out and uh, really appreciate being able to uh, be, be part of this. And when I come up to Winnipeg, I'm going to stop in and, me and meet with you all. Absolutely. Got to do that. <laughs> okay. We'll get you up here yet. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thanks. See you all. Thanks very much. Have a good evening. Good night. All right. Good night. All right. You too.